wrapped up the book of Joshua, and we're ready to take up the book of Judges. Judges comes after the book of Joshua. That's not a terribly profound point, but it's not just because you turn the page in the Bible. The events of Judges follow immediately after the end of the book of Joshua. So, in the book of Judges, uh, there's not really a, a gap in time between the end of Joshua and the beginning of Judges. However, the events of the book of Joshua took, well, let's say 25 years or so. The events of the book of Judges are going to span about 350 years. A very long time, many generations. Right? <clears throat> If we wanted to plot the action of the two books by way of contrast, Joshua, we start out with, they're not in slavery, they're not down all the way, but Israel begins crossing over the Jordan, and conquest, you'll have a couple of, you'll have a couple of incidents where they they fall, but they're restored pretty quickly. And so the overall action of the book of Joshua is very hopeful, right? In terms of literature, this is going to be a comedy, not because it's funny, but because they start low and end up high, right? Judges is going to look like this. Judges, they're going to start off right where they left off at the end of Joshua. Joshua gives these two magnificent farewell addresses. He tells the people, keep the faith, remember the covenant, don't forget the Lord, don't depart from the law, the Lord will give you everything you need. Do not fear, don't be dismayed, don't be afraid, the Lord will give you your enemies into your hands. And Israel is so zealous for this that even when the eastern tribes build the altar of witness, without telling the western tribes, the western tribes are ready to go to war because they think the eastern tribes are committing adult, uh, uh, idolatry and that they're in danger of bringing curse upon the whole of Israel, right? So they're very worried about God's judgment and they're very zealous for his law. Starting off high, after Joshua, there are going to be a series of judges, right? And that's where the book gets its name. A judge, we normally think of a judge being a jurist who sits in an academic gown on the bench and makes rulings on cases under the law. These judges are not that. What, what sort of men are these judges? They're closer to something like a tribal chieftain. Or maybe a warlord. They are warriors. They're men of battle. They're men of action. They're part of what we're going to call the cycle of the judges. And the cycle of the judges is a pattern you're going to see repeated throughout this book. We've mentioned it before. And we begin the book in this way, where there's peace. And of course, what, what do good times lead to? Satiety. Sin. Right? After that comes oppression. After oppression comes cries for deliverance. We might also use the term repentance. The 
the Lord will raise up a Savior. The Savior will again restore peace, right? And there's this cycle. However, it's not quite like a rotating wheel that repeats the cycle over and over. It's more like, and unfortunately this is only a two-dimensional whiteboard, I'd like, you know, if we exist in the fourth dimension, I guess we could make a 3D one. It's a downward spiral. So that with each iteration of this cycle, things get worse and worse and worse. So the first judge, we're not gonna know much about him, but the first judge, things are gonna go very well, by comparison. By the time you get to the final judge, not only does he not know the law of God, he doesn't know anything about the nature or the character of God, he knows nothing of God. And then at the end of the book, these last two chapters, um, all of Israel is going to forget God, and, and, and the book is going to end in a very dark and dismal place. Um, and looking for the gospel in the book of Judges is not, it's not quite even like Isaiah, where you'll, you'll find interspersed throughout here these beautiful sayings of, of hopefulness. The gospel you're going to have to find in things like, well, at least the Lord didn't entirely wipe them off the map like he could have and probably should have. <laughs> at least once they were utterly destroyed and in slavery, at least they called out for someone and at least he sent a savior eventually. Right? So there is gospel and judges, but it's not... It's not beaming through in the way it's going to in other books. Because Israel is in the middle of a tremendous apostasy. And this apostasy is going to show itself in all of the life of Israel. Okay, the first two chapters are going to be kind of a prologue. They're going to set the scene. They're going to give you kind of the tone of the book and, and why the judges are going to be necessary. Any questions so far? So the time period we're looking at, by the way, we're going to be ending somewhere, I don't know, maybe, where do we end in the book of Judges? 1088 BC, that sounds about right. Um, you're a good mile marker for the Old Testament, by the way, is the year 1000 BC. It's a, it's a good round number. And who's on the throne of Israel in 1000 BC? David right? The, the reign of David spans both sides of the, of the year 1000 BC. So that's kind of a, that's a benchmark if you want to get a, just a, a close guesstimate as to where we are. But again, we're, we're going to begin around 1375 maybe BC. And so this is really going to span something like 350 years, give or take. All right, before we dig in with chapter one, let's open with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your mercies, which are new every morning. We bless your name for all that you have done for us in sending your Son. We thank you also for what you have done for your people Israel, that you uh, continue to give them grace and to offer to them saviors and salvation. And we thank you especially for holding to your promise to send the, the one triumphal Savior who has saved all of us from slavery to sin and to death. Open to us the scriptures by your Spirit, that we may see your Son, in all of Scripture, and cling to him alone, in whose name we pray. Amen. It'd be very easy to do the Pharisee's prayer. I thank you, O Lord, that I'm not like these stiff-necked people. <laughs> and about that, on the one hand, you will see in, the, in Israel, in these cycles, you'll see something of the Christian life. You know, you leave church on Sunday, you're zealous, you're going to do it this week, you're going to finally, and then, you know, by the time you get home, you've already cussed out the driver in front of you because he cut you off. And, um, so you, you do see something of the cycle within each Christian. 
However, the people of Israel do seem to be disposed to idolatry in extreme sorts of ways. I mean, there are peoples who, when they got the gospel, they basically left idolatry behind. I mean, at least like outward acts of idolatry. They were not worshiping carved images anymore. They still coveted. But, you know, like when the German people got the gospel, by and large, they were not building like oak groves and worshiping them again, that kind of thing. Israel, man, we had this golden retriever growing up. And for some reason, this golden was absolutely addicted to hair. And so like brushes that were full of hair, they had to be put up. Because if that brush was anywhere where the dog could get it, she was just on it. That's like Israel with these stupid carved images and these pagans around them in, in Canaan. It's like, they just get near these Canaanites, they just become Canaanites. They're just, they're just circumcised Canaanites. It's like, you'll, you'll see throughout this why the Lord is going to command that they have to be cut off from the rest of the peoples. Um, so, Judges chapter 1. After the death of Joshua, the people of Israel inquired of the Lord, Who shall go up first for us against the Canaanites to fight against them? The Lord said, Judah shall go up. Behold, I have given the land into his hand. Okay, so first of all, we're starting off on a good note. Jo I mean, not that Joshua's death is good, but um, when Israel knows that Joshua needs to be replaced, and so how do they go about finding someone to replace him? They inquire of the Lord. Now, they're not going into their prayer closet and waiting for the still small voice to speak to them in the darkness. Don't do that. That's, that's a great way to get misled. How do they inquire of the Lord? Remember the priests have the Urim and the Thummim? And the Lord speaks to the priests? Yeah. So, in other words... It's through the means that the Lord appointed to speak to Israel. At this point, they're a theocracy, not like Iran. They're a theocracy in that they are directly led by God. This is the best system of government there could be. <laughs> God makes the best king because he's God, right? So not only is he wise, he's powerful. And he's immortal. The king will never die. Um, Israel's going to reject this king. Um, but the Lord is going to speak to them through the means that he appointed through the priests. And he says, who's going to go first? Judah. Now, who's Judah? Judah is the tribe of Judah, right? I mean, Judah the man is long dead. This is the tribe of Judah. And also Simeon, his brother. So even though both Judah and Simeon the men are long dead, the tribes are going to be like brothers to one another, as Judah and Simeon were, to the point that even the tribes are referred to as brothers to one another, right? Um, it's it's kind of neat how the Lord speaks about these nations. It's like they have their own character, and, and he, he describes them that way. Um, so Judah's going to go up first. Now, where is Judah? So we have our... our Dead Sea, Jordan River, Sea of Galilee, Mediterranean. Judah's going to be here-ish, right? And remember how he said, by the end of the book of Joshua, these lands are still going to be, and maybe down into the Negev, are still going to be occupied by Canaanites, right? So a lot of the work is yet to be done of conquering the land and driving out the Canaanites. So Judah's going to go first, and they are... They're going to sweep away the Canaanites. Oh, okay. <laughs> they put the hands right oh, on. So it's going to be worse. This is amazing. Yeah. Okay. It's so bad, it's good. 
And Judah said to Simeon, his brother, come up with me into the territory allotted to me that we may fight against the Canaanites. And I likewise will go with you into the territory allotted to you. So Simeon went with him. Then Judah went up and the Lord gave the Canaanites and the Perizzites into their hand and they defeated 10,000 of them at Bezek, right? So again, how are Judah and Simeon winning these battles? By the favor of the Lord. Still, right, still by the Lord's hand. The Lord is going to deliver to them 10,000 of their enemies dead, right? And we see also that the various pagans of the land, the Canaanites and the, uh, in this case, it was the Perizzites, are going to be joining forces, right? Maybe they don't get along so well otherwise, but they have a common enemy in Israel. They're going to ally themselves against Israel, and, uh, and they're going to die together, right? Verse 5, they found Adoni Bezek at Bezek and fought against him and defeated the Canaanites and the Perizzites. Adoni Bezek fled, but they pursued him and caught him and cut off his thumbs and his big toes. Now, you're going to find that Judges is, um, is a violent book. It's, it's, it's going to contain images of violence more graphic than even Joshua. Yes, question. Why did they cut off his thumbs and his big toes? Well, why would you cut off someone's thumbs and big toes in war? What can't he do? He can't pick up a sword or a bow or a rock. And he can't run away. <laughs> but why that specifically? It seems cruel, but if you follow to the next verse, you'll find out why. And Adoni Bezek said, Seventy kings with their thumbs and their big toes cut off used to pick up scraps under my table. As I have done, so God has repaid me. And they brought him to Jerusalem, and he died there. Okay, so what... Had Adoni Bezek done, this regional king, he did, the same thing. he did that very same thing to 70 kings. And not only did he do that, he humiliated them by making them beg for scraps <coughs> under his table, thumbless and big toeless. <laughs> this is a cruel, cruel man. And he recognized, well, I did that to 70 kings, and now... Israel's God has done that to me. I guess it's only fair. It's, this, is, this, is not, this is not the kind of thing we have much experience with. It's very outside of our experience. But these are very brutal times. And, uh, and he had done this to them. And now he's, he's received his recompense, his just desserts. However, where do they bring him back to? Jerusalem. Now, the, the tabernacle is probably still in Shiloh because Judah has not conquered all this land yet. And remember, Jerusalem is going to be here-ish. Right? You've got like Jericho and Shiloh. Jerusalem is kind of in the middle of Judah's territory, right? But that, that whole land has not, been, has not been taken yet. So likely he's, he's, this is his headquarters, his capital. Right? And they bring him back there. Verse 8. And the men of Judah fought against Jerusalem and captured it and struck it with the edge of the sword and set the city on fire. Afterward, the men of Judah went down to fight against the Canaanites who lived in the hill country in the Negev and in the lowland, right? These are three different places, by the way. The hill country, the Negev, and the lowland are different places. The hill country is going to be where? Right, down beneath, not just south of, but lower in elevation than Mount Zion and Jerusalem. Because remember, that's, that's the, the, the geographic feature of Jerusalem. It's built on a mountain, Mount Zion, right? And so, in the Bible, people go up to Jerusalem and down from Jerusalem. Right? We always joked about this whenever we had to go to Laramie, Wyoming. It's at like 7,200 feet. You go up to Laramie, down from Laramie. It's like Jerusalem. Um, the, the hill country is going to surround that. Where's the Negev? 
the south. Further south, and what sort of land is the Negev? Desert. It, yeah, it's, it's wasteland, it's desert, right? There's not much there at all. It's, it's a lot, so if, if you look at the map and you see how much Judah has, you think, oh man, Ju Judah really had some favor, and he does. But a lot of this land is not, not available to do much with. On the other hand, some of the tribes that have smaller parcels up close to the Sea of Galilee are going to be, you know, verdant, flowering, arable. Um. So, they begin sweeping through South Canaan, um, removing the, the Canaanites. And Judah went against the Canaanites who lived in Hebron. Now the name of Hebron was formerly Kiriath Arba. And they defeated Sheshai and Ahiman and Taimal. Talmai, sorry. Um, you'll only need to know two of those names for the test. <laughs> there, there are lots of names and places in the book of Judges. Those are there because th these things did happen. It's not as critical that you remember the names of, of, all, the, of, of all the Canaanites. But you see the scope of the conquest. And you see these actions are going to take long periods of time, right? It's not, you know, one day you defeat this city, one day defeat this city. This is going to take a lot of time. From there, verse 11, they went against the inhabitants of Deber. The name of Deber was formerly kiriath Sefer. And Caleb said, he who attacks kiriath Sefer and captures it, I will give him Aksa, my daughter, for a wife. Now, Caleb, that's a name we know, right? Who's Caleb? One of the spies, right? How many spies were sent into Canaan? Twelve. Two of them were faithful, right? And what do we mean by, by that? Reported what they saw. Well, they didn't. Accurate, accurate. Honestly, they reported kind of what they didn't see, which is that God has given them into our hand. The other ten said they're big. They have arms, not arms, but like swords and stuff. They have shields, they have walls, right? The other two reported back based not on what they saw, but based on God's promise, right? And those two men were, this is like a Paul Harvey story, right? And those two men were Caleb, Caleb and Joshua, right? The same Joshua that we've known from the previous book, and now Caleb, the other faithful spy. And Caleb... The Lord, the Lord does use a little competition every now and then. I mean, I mean Paul does that when he's raising funds for, for his missionary work. Hey, you know, you should outdo one another. And, and <laughs> But here, Caleb is going to say, tell you what, whoever takes this city, he can have my daughter. Presumably, this was a very good prize. So, who ends up taking the city? Well, in verse 13, Othniel, the son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother captured it. So, <laughs> Caleb's daughter goes to her uncle. Her uncle. Okay, cool. Yeah, just want to make sure I got that right. <laughs> yeah. We've had these before, right? Where <laughs> you, you, you make this, this vow, this promise, and then <clears throat> you didn't anticipate how it was going to go. But Othniel takes, takes her for a wife. When she came to him, she urged him to ask her father for a field. And she dismounted from her donkey, and Caleb said to her, What do you want? She said to him, Give me a blessing. Since you have set me in the land of the Negev, give me also springs of water. And Caleb gave her the upper springs and the lower springs. Right. So they're going to make a house where? In the wilderness of the Negev. So she says, tell you what, if we're going to be living in the wilderness, what? Put us near some water. At least put us near some water. Right? So he gives her the upper springs and the lower springs. So he's good to her. He honors her request. And she seems pretty shrewd. That's a, <laughs> that's a pretty smart, forward-thinking sort of request, right? Well, we're going to be in the wilderness. We're going to need some water. So there she is. 
Verse 16, And the descendants of the Kenite, Moses' father-in-law, went up with the people of Judah from the city of Palms into the wilderness of Judah, which lies in the Negev near Arad, and they went and settled with the people. So who's the Kenite? Moses' father-in-law. Jethro. Jethro, yeah, right? And if you're like me, you're either thinking of the Beverly Hillbillies or the rock guy with the flute. Oh, I thought of both right now. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly what I said. It's like Jethro Tull. Right, yeah. So yeah, so the descendants of Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, they go up with Judah. They settle there with the people. Verse 17. And Judah went with Simeon, his brother, and they defeated the Canaanites who inhabited Zephath and devoted it to destruction. So the name of the city was called Hormah. Judah also captured Gaza with its territory and Ashkelon with its territory and Ekron with its territory. And the Lord was with Judah and he took possession of the hill country, but he could not drive out the inhabitants of the plain because they had chariots of iron. And Hebron was given to Caleb, as Moses had said, and he drove out from it the three sons of Anak. Okay, before we get to verse 21, so far, so good. Little hitch with some of the Canaanites because they have iron chariots. But it's not like they didn't want to drive them out. It's just they were unable to. That's, you're still okay under God's law that way, right? Because the Lord's going to give them the victory. But the command was what with the Canaanites? Destroy them. Drive them out of the land, right? Put them to death drive them away, possess all the land. Do not, most of all, two things you do not do with the Canaanites. Take their women. You don't marry them. You don't take their women, right? And this is where there's a lot of application that's good for us now. Why don't you marry the Canaanite women? Wouldn't they turn into good Israelites? No. no. Instead, the Israelites become circumcised Canaanites, right? How have so many Bible-believing church bodies and Christians become more and more accepting of gay marriage and homosexuality? Is it because a really whiz-bang theologian sat down with the Bible and said, I think, you've been, I think you've been misreading these passages. Let me explain to you what Paul really meant here. Or does it go something like this? Um, I just got a call from my sister and my nephew's gay. Now what? In other words, it's not hitting us at the theological level. I mean, it is a theological problem, don't get me wrong. But it's not like someone sitting down with the Book of Concord and the Bible and the Church Fathers and let's talk through how this should really go. Why not? That's God's domain. The Word of God? That's God's best weapon that he uses against the devil. That's what Jesus uses when he does battle with the devil, and he's God in the flesh. He uses the Bible. So the devil's not going to want to engage on the level of the Bible to say, well, the Bible's wrong. Christians are too, we're, we're, we're too well fortified against that attack. Instead, it's more like, well, now you've got to choose, Christian. Are you going to just say nothing, go along with it, and just slowly become more and more accepting of this practice? in order to keep peace in your family? Or do you fear God, stick with his word, and become an outcast among your own relatives? And, and it's happening in every single family that any of us knows about, somewhere. It's, it's so widespread at this point. It's, it's everybody's story. And it's, it's, not, it's not hitting us at the level of understanding the Bible. It's hitting us at the level of, what am I going to do about Thanksgiving? What am I going to say? Do I even go? And those choices are much harder because they're much closer to home, right? This is precisely why the Lord commands, don't marry the Canaanites. Maybe their women are beautiful. You have women in your own tribes. Take them. 
don't take the Canaanite women because you'll become like the Canaanites. And not to spoil it, but again, it's 3,000 years, I think spoilers are, spoilers are over. When they settle near the Canaanites, they become like the Canaanites. And understand too, when we talk about idolatry, <laughs> idolatry is gonna be a major, major theme of, I mean the Bible and the Old Testament, sure, but especially in the book of Judges, because the Canaanites, whom they're supposed to be driving out, are idolatrous. When we talk about idolatry, yes, it means that they're wrong about God, they have wrong theology, they teach false doctrine, but it's not like they're Mormons, where they take the flavor of Christianity and, and use it, you know, the, 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 the forms of Christianity and the trappings of Christianity in service to a false god. We're talking about carved statues and what do they do with the carved statues? Do they meet one day a week and, and discuss what the carved statue wants? No. It's temple prostitution. That is, prostitutes working in service at the temple, in service of that idol, as a religious service. It's orgies. And the Greeks were not the only ones to engage in this kind of thing. It's it's various forms of, of adultery, and to, to clean it up as best I can. And what are you almost always going to find? Child sacrifice. When you live in a people that are pagan, and you're a woman or a child, you are in much greater danger than if you live in a Christian land. Um, and so... When we talk about idolatry, it's, it's not just the false teaching. I mean, false teaching is bad enough on its own. It is. There are whole commandments that deal with that. But it's so much more than that. It's that they become as, as anti-God, as ungodly as one could be. Right? Also, bear that in mind when you hear about the numbers of Canaanites being driven out. Don't, don't shed too many tears for them. Um, the, the world is better with fewer child sacrificers. Um, but idolatry is always going to be closely linked with another sin, and that is adultery, to the point that in the Bible, they're almost synonymous. That, you know, in, in the New Testament, how is the church described? The bride of Christ, right? He's the bridegroom. He cares for the church. He loves the church and, and provides for her and protects her, right? When she seeks out other gods, that's idolatry, but it's also like adultery. It's, it's, it's almost like they're kind of the same sort of thing, right? And in, in Judges, and you're, you're really going to see it in Jeremiah, when Israel goes after other gods, what verb is sometimes used? They go whoring after other gods. <laughs> it's going to show up later in, 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 in chapter 2. Like in the preaching of Jesus, especially you'll see this in John chapter 8. When Jesus is talking to the Jews, um, and, they, and he says, you're of your father the devil, he says, He's a liar and the father of lies. And he also says he's a murderer from the beginning, right? Lies and murder go together. And it's not hard to see why. Murderers often lie about their activity because they don't want to be seen as a murderer. And lies are often a pretext to harming our neighbor in some way, right? So, idolatry is going to be the sin that is, that is most tempting Israel right now. And... And along with that goes, goes the adultery as well. Okay. So we left off and everything was hunky-dory at the end of verse 20. Now verse 21. But the people of Benjamin did not drive out the Jebusites who lived in Jerusalem, so the Jebusites have lived with the people of Benjamin in Jerusalem to this day. Because that's the second thing you weren't supposed to do with the Canaanites, right? Don't marry their women and... 
don't hit, don't leave them alive. Yeah. Don't make treaties with them. Right? Well, that already happened with the Jebusites. And they're going to dwell in Jerusalem at least until the days of Saul. Right? <clears throat> 22. The house of Joseph also went up against Bethel, and the Lord was with them. And the house of Joseph scouted out Bethel. Now the name of the city was formerly Luz. And the spies saw a man coming out of the city, and they said to him, Please show us the way into the city, and we will deal kindly with you. And he showed them the way into the city, and they struck the city with the edge of the sword, but they let the man and all his family go. And the man went to the land of the Hittites and built a city and called its name Luz. That is its name to this day. So, the command was, drive out the Canaanites, all of them. Don't marry them, don't leave them alive, don't make treaties. Well, you already have the asterisk, the oopsie, with the Jebusites, and now they have to deal with them. But now also you have the city of Luz, where they escaped the sword, right? So Judah did his part, Simeon did his part, but now you get to Benjamin, and Benjamin didn't do his part, and it just kind of goes downhill from there. Manasseh. Manasseh did not drive out the inhabitants of Beth Shean and its villages, or to Ankh and its villages, or the inhabitants of Dor and its village, villages, or the inhabitants of, of Ibliam and its villages, or the inhabitants of, of Megiddo and its villages. For the Canaanites persisted in dwelling in that land, when Israel grew strong, they put the Canaanites to forced labor, but did not drive them out completely. Okay, so just looking at Benjamin, just the tribe of Benjamin, um, Benjamin did not drive out all the Canaanites. They stopped short, right? And, and it's listed. We didn't talk about authorship. Traditionally, who's the author of, of uh, Judges? Traditionally, Samuel, there's not really anything in the text that... Unknown. Yeah, it, it is kind of unknown. Um, it makes sense for it to be Samuel. It's, it's certainly not written until the days of Samuel. And we know that because we're, we're told often, and, and especially at the end of, of chapter 22, in those, you know, these were the days in which Israel had no king, right? In other words, there would come days when Israel did have a king. Those would be in the days of Samuel. So it, it makes sense for it to be written during the days of Samuel the prophet. Um, but, but it's not certain from the text. So, um, so Benjamin did not drive out all the inhabitants. In other words, they didn't do what God told them to do. And what did Joshua tell them to do? Follow God. Yeah, follow God. Do what God told you to do. Drive them out. And... Already, they're failing, right? Do you think that's maybe part of why Jerusalem is <coughs> the city where prophets go to die? Is that why Jerusalem is, a, is the place where prophets go to die? Yeah. There is a special <laughs> evil in Jerusalem that never really goes away. Mm -hmm. um, there, and, and, and you're going to see this here. You're going to see this elsewhere. You're going to see this during the days of the prophet Jeremiah. Of course, this is where John the Baptist is put to death. This is where Jesus is put to death. Um, we call it the Holy Land, and there's reason for that, because the events of the Bible happen there, but there was plenty of unholiness <coughs> in, in those places. And it seems like Jerusalem is especially drawn to faithlessness. I mean, it's, it's no wonder that when Jesus pulls up to Jerusalem, he pauses for a second, and you can almost hear him sigh before he weeps over Jerusalem. Like, oh, this place. And, you know, being God and knowing his Bible, he knows what's happened there. Um, and he's going to be, he's not just going to be part of it, he's going to be the worst of it. Because there they don't just kill a prophet, they don't just kill an innocent man, they're going to kill God. Um, yeah, it, it, it does keep coming back to that, and there is, there is something about Jerusalem. Okay. 29, Ephraim. Ephraim did not drive out the Canaanites who lived in Gezer, so the Canaanites lived in Gezer among them. Zebulun did not drive out the inhabitants of Kitron or the inhabitants of Nahalal, so the Canaanites lived among them but became subject to forced labor. 
Asher did not drive out the inhabitants of Akko, or the inhabitants of Sidon, or of Alab, or of Oxib, or of Helba, or of Aphek, or of Rehob. So the Asherites lived among the Canaanites, the inhabitants of the land, for they did not drive them out. So, so far you have kind of two different ways of these various tribes dealing with the Canaanites. None of them were doing what God told them. It's either they're going to make slaves out of them, make them a slave class, once Israel gets strong enough in the land, or they just settle among them and just... You, you can imagine that, that they begin being somewhat separated, but that probably doesn't last. 33. Naphtali did not drive out the inhabitants of Beth Shemesh, or the inhabitants of Beth Anath. So they lived among the Canaanites, the inhabitants of the land. Nevertheless, the inhabitants of Beth Shemesh and of Beth Anath became subject to forced labor for them. The Amorites pressed the people of Dan back into the hill country, for they did not allow them to come down to the plain. The Amorites persisted in dwelling in Mount Heres, in Aijalon, and in Shaalbim. But the hand of the house of Joseph rested heavily on them, and they became subject to forced labor. And the border of the Amorites ran from the ascent of Akrabim from Selah and upward. Okay, so each tribe's story is going to go a little bit differently, but in each case, with the exception of Judah and Simeon, and of course Levi, because that's a whole other matter, um, in each of these cases, they're not doing fully what God commands, right? We're not always told why. I don't know if it's because they grow weary. My guess is, is it has something to do with they, they think they're nicer than God. Um, they, they don't like God's command, so they're not going to carry it out fully. They don't understand why God wants to command this. What's so bad about their idolatry? Um, but for whatever reason, they don't complete what God gave them to do. And now, Judges chapter 2. It is easier. It is easier, yes. Now the angel of the Lord went up from Gilgal to Bochim. Because remember, the angel of the Lord was at Gilgal already before, right? Joshua was about to begin his conquest of kind of central Canaan. And he looks up and he sees the angel of the Lord standing there with a the sword drawn. And what does Joshua say to the angel? Are you for us or against us? <laughs> and he says, no, right? But, you know, I've, I've, I've come to... To destroy my enemies, right? He's, he's going he's gonna to engage on that, on that conquest throughout the book of Joshua. And now the angel of the Lord is going to move from Gilgal to Bochim. And he said, I brought you up out of Egypt and brought you into the land that I swore to give to your fathers. Okay, so who is the angel of the Lord here? It's almost always Jesus. The angel of the Lord is almost always going to be Jesus, yes. But here we know this for certain because he said, I brought you up out of the land of Egypt, right? And remember, how does God refer to himself in the Old Testament? Many times it's, I'm the one, I'm the God who brought you out of Egypt. That's how the Ten Commandments begins, right? I'm the Lord your God who brought you up out of the land of Egypt, right? And the other messengers always say, thus said the Lord. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, the other messengers will say, thus says the Lord, and he's going to say, I did this, right? So here we're on very, very safe ground saying, this is the Son of God, right? This is the second person of the Trinity. I said, I will never break my covenant with you, and you shall make no covenant with the inhabitants of this land. You shall break down their altars, but you have not obeyed my voice. What is this you have done? So now I say, I will not drive them out before you, but they shall become thorns in your sides, and their gods shall be a snare to you. As soon as the angel of the Lord spoke these words to all the people of Israel, the people lifted up their voices and wept, and they called the name of that place Bokim, and they sacrificed there to the Lord. Right? Bokim means like weepers, mourners, that kind of thing. Um, so... The nature of their conquest is going to change dramatically from this point forward. Prior to this point, the victories in Canaan that the people of Israel had were because the Lord gave the Canaanites into Israel's hand. And so you see these incredibly lopsided victories that make no human sense with these smaller armies defeating these larger, better trained, stronger, taller armies. But again, we know why. It's because the Lord was giving them into their hand. And so 
The Lord was doing the fighting, and so the Lord was victorious. At this point, Israel is going to be fighting under their own power. Why? Because they thought that they were no one else. Yeah, because they didn't do what they were supposed to do, and that was, that was the agreement. That was the covenant. Do my law, and I will drive out the Canaanites for you. Not just, I'll teach you the, the secret tr tricks of how to drive out Canaanites that I learned by building up my own business. He's God. He'll drive them out. All they have to do is obey his word, and they'll always have the victory. They were unwilling to do that, and so now, the other part of this, uh, this, this covenant is, is enforced. If you don't, they're going to fight under their own power. And that's what's going to happen. He says, I'm not going to drive them out before you any longer. And not only that, since they're going to be there, they're going to be what? Thorns in your sides, right? They're going to harass you. And, and, and more than that, their gods are going to be what? A snare. What's a snare? It's a trap, right? A, a temptation, right? And of course, Israel, Israel is especially prone to idolatry. And so being surrounded by all of these idols, they're going to constantly be tempted by these idols that should have been dr driven out of the land, but they didn't do it. So now they're going to have to face this temptation. And they're going to have to, if they're going to, if they're going to live there, they're going to have to defend the land they've taken and maybe try to take more, but now without God's help. Sounds like you're reading the news out of so, week. Yeah, it sounds like you're reading the news. Yes. Yeah, right. Verse 6. When Joshua dismissed the people, the people of Israel went, each to his inheritance, to take possession of the land. And the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua, who had seen all the great work that the Lord had done for Israel. And Joshua, the son of Don, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110 years. And they buried him within the boundaries of its inheritance in timnath Heres, in the hill country of Ephraim, north of the mountain of Gaash. And all that generation also were gathered to their fathers, and there arose another generation after them who did not know the Lord or the work that he had done for Israel. So despite all of the work done throughout the book of Joshua to remember the various monuments and altars and, and, the, and the rites and the rituals, it didn't get passed down from Joshua's generation to the next one. Just one generation, right? Didn't President Reagan have a warning about that when it came to like freedom? Right. Well... Israel is one generation away from idolatry. And so in one generation, they lost what they were supposed to pass on to the younger generation. And now there's a people that doesn't know God. Okay. And the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and served the Baals. Oh, and by the way, how long was Israel faithful? As long as Joshua was alive. Right? Isn't this true of so many families? There's a, there's a patriarch, a matriarch, who's very pious, and as long as they're alive, everything's held together, and as soon as that ends, they fall apart. This is going to happen to Israel not only when Joshua dies, but with the death of every single judge. Right? They're faithful while the judge is raised up, and once the judge dies, they fall apart, and they actually get worse. Verse, um, verse 12 and they abandoned the Lord, the God of their fathers, who had brought them out of the land of Egypt. They went after other gods from among the gods of the people whose peoples who were around them and bowed down to them. And they provoked the Lord to anger. They abandoned the Lord and served the Baals and the Ashtaroth. We don't have a lot of time to talk about the Baals and the Ashtaroth. We'll, we'll do uh, a little excursus on that next week, on, on who the Baals and the Ashtaroth were. Because they, they come up a lot in the Bible, not just in the book of Judges. So the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and he gave them over to plunderers who plundered them. And he sold them into the hand of their surrounding enemies, so that they could no longer withstand their enemies. Whenever they marched out, the hand of the Lord was against them for harm, as the Lord had warned, 
and as the Lord had sworn to them, and they were in terrible distress. Right? You are here. <laughs> right? There's peace. Everyone goes back to their land. They start serving the Baals on the Ashtaroth. The Lord's hand is not neutral. It's against them. And wasn't that the lie that was always sold to us, especially throughout the 20th century, right? The idea that there was ever neutral territory. They called it secular, right? Well, there's, there's good and there's evil, but then there's the middle, right? That was the lie we were always sold. That's just, that doesn't exist anywhere in the Bible, right? There is good, there's evil, there's heaven, there's hell, there's God, there's the, the devil. Yes? Where were the Levites? Were the, they, why were they keeping people in check? And... Yeah, why weren't the Levites keeping them in check? Um, my guess is they fell too. Because, yeah, they, they're supposed to be peppered throughout the land. They have their own cities and, and, and among the various tribes. And they're not, either their warnings are not effective or they're falling into sin too. My, my guess is they're falling into sin too. So, they're sold into slavery. They're plundered. They're attacked. They're besieged. They lose territory. And now... Now they're crying out for deliverance, right? This is establishing the pattern of this, this called the cycle of the judges that we're going to see throughout the book, right? Sixteen. Then the Lord raised up judges who saved them out of the hand of those who plundered them. So God will raise up judges, and we used the word savior, right? Um... Understanding, of course, that this is a lowercase s savior. This is not Jesus. But they do do some work of saving their people, right? They come up and they fight. They serve as, as, as a moral center for them, as, as an authority. They put their enemies to death. Israel gets behind them. And Israel does great as long as that judge is alive. But when the judge dies, not only do they fall back into their old habits, they get worse than they were before. Now, in each case with the judges, each man, asterisk, because one of them is not a man, um, each, each of the judges has God's favor in that God is going to do his work through them. That does not mean that God approves of the moral character of each of the judges, particularly the, the latter judges, right? The, the latter judges are going to be morally pretty bad to the point that the, the, the last of the judges are going to, to not know anything about God, his character, his nature, um, and be morally pretty, pretty bad men anyway, right? So... When, when, we, when we talk about a judge, the judge is raised up by God, and God does his work through the judge, but don't think that means that God approves of everything the judge does. I'm here addressing every Sunday school teacher who ever teaches about Samson. <laughs> Gideon, imperfect. Samson, he's imperfect would be an improvement. Um, okay, so... We're kind of here. They're crying out, right? And chapter 2 is giving the basic pattern for the whole book. Yes? Is judge like the Hebrew translation of the word? Like... Yeah, it's right. It, it, I guess it doesn't translate that neatly into English. Um, okay. they're, they're judges or they're, uh, they're saviors. The word could just as easily be saviors. Okay. Yeah, because to me it always seems, reading judges, is that the actual judge is more of a means of wrath than uh, like the righteous savior. Yes, exactly. Um, his, his point was that the judge is sometimes even more than being a righteous savior, he's an agent of wrath against God's enemies. I think that's fair, especially in the book of Judges. Okay. Then the Lord raised up judges who saved them out of the hand of those who plundered them, yet... 
Look at verse 17. It's one of the saddest verses. They did not listen to their judges, for they whored after other gods and bowed down to them. Right? So, again, they're oppressed. They cry for deliverance. They repent. The Lord raises up a Savior. But they didn't listen to the Savior. They didn't listen to the judge. Right? Yeah. Like, judge, did you see just what happened to these people? Right. And you're going to do what they're doing? Yeah, there's, there's no memory whatsoever. They're like goldfish or something. Just, there's, it's always year zero. There's, there's no past. There's no lesson to learn from, right? Which is why we're studying this. One of the ways you overcome this is by learning something about history. Not so that we can argue and go, this is more like the Spanish Civil War. No, -uh, this is more like World War I. No, that's, that's fruitless. That's pointless. The point is, learn what happens to people who forsake the Lord. Learn about how real his wrath is and what it looks like to be given over into your enemy's hands. But then also, look at how gracious God is, even with this totally stiff-necked people. I mean, you, you cannot look at Israel and ever say they didn't have it coming. If anything, you could say, I'm kind of surprised it took God that long. Which is grace. But you see his grace over and over and over again. It, it doesn't run out. Now, the Lord's punishments may be very stern and severe and, and painful. No doubt about that. But he still raises up saviors. He still raises up these judges. And the fact that they're lowercase s saviors, that they're judges, that they're agents of wrath, they're, they're pointing forward to one who's going to come and, and finally, in a climactic sort of way, do the work of saving that none of these judges could do. And that, of course, is going to be Jesus. Okay. Pastor Anderson, in yes. verse 16, it says, uh, out of the, raise the judges up who saved them out of the hand of those who plundered them. I know in Exodus, the Israelites plundered the Egyptians when they left. Is this the first case when the Israelites are being plundered themselves? So the question is, is, is Israel plundered Egypt on the way out of Egypt? Is this the first time Israel's being plundered after that? I think it is. And so then is it fair to say that uh, it is by God's hand that uh, deliverance and righteousness can be punishment or reward? Oh, yeah, yeah. All, all of this is going to be either punishment or reward. And, and all of this is coming from God. This is, this is not accidental at all. Um, that Israel's plundered is directly a consequence of their faithlessness. Okay, verse 18. Whenever the Lord raised up judges for them, the Lord was with the judge, and he saved them from the hand of their enemies all the days of the judge. For the Lord was moved to pity by their groaning because of those who afflicted and oppressed them. Right? That's here. But wherever the whenever the judge died, they turned back and were more corrupt than their fathers, going after other gods, serving them and bowing down to them. They did not drop any of their practices or their stubborn ways. So the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and he said, Because this people has transgressed my covenant that I commanded their fathers and have not obeyed my voice, I will no longer drive out before them any of the nations that Joshua left when he died, in order to test Israel by them, whether they will take care to walk in the way of the Lord as their fathers did or not. So the Lord left those nations, not driving them out quickly, and did not give them into the hand of Joshua. So that's, that's the setup for the, the reign of the first judge, who's going to be Othniel. Questions so far? Okay, so next week, we'll start with, with the reign of Othniel. And uh, this will be the better time of the judges, before things get worse and worse. Um, but we'll see that, that pattern that we established in chapter 2. We'll see it enacted throughout the, the, the lives of these various judges. Hey, God, why'd you smash them. that idol? I liked that idol. Yeah, yeah like I said, this, this is, as far as books of the Bible go, it's, it's pretty sober. But it's, it's necessary for us to know something of the character of God's grace, to see his grace around this people at this time. All right, let's close with the Lord's Prayer.
Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. All right, thank you.